this proceeding, basically, there are four elements that I have to uh, uh, receive information regarding. In information you are about to see, much of which has gone unreported until now, will shake the very foundation of the government's cover story about what happened in the Morrow Building in Oklahoma City on the morning of April the 19th, 1995. The news staffs of ABC TV and Radio, CNN, Associated Press, as well as those of Time and Newsweek magazines have known most of these facts for several months. They have chosen to ignore everything that does not seem to further incriminate the FBI's designated guilty parties. For the next 90 minutes, settle back in your easy chair and place yourself in the jury box. You will be seeing evidence that the juries in the real-life trials of Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols may never be allowed to see. Some time ago, a number of calls came into our network here at White Springs that indicated something was very wrong in the Oklahoma bombing matter. Families of the victims spoke out. They said things were not as the national media was portraying supposed facts. We started looking into the Oklahoma bombing and became more and more concerned to the point where we commissioned this team to take cameras, investigators and reporters to Oklahoma City and elsewhere to try to put the pieces together. Expensive, dangerous, but somebody has to do it. What follows now is their report. Hi, I'm Pat Shannon. Over the past five months I have had five separate trips back to Oklahoma City to investigate those mysterious bombings. As you can imagine, it must have been a horrible and a terrifying scene that morning. Men and women went to work, just as they'd always done, and suddenly died. Trusting parents took their children to a daycare center on the second floor, which just happened to be positioned to where it took the brunt of the seven floors of concrete above it falling. And 19 children were crushed to death that morning. President Clinton if you remember, came on the following Sunday to a memorial service for those children at one of the churches in downtown Oklahoma City. In our private investigative circles, we refer to the bombings, plural, because while indeed there may have been an explosion in a rider rental truck outside on the street that morning, there also were multiple explosions inside the building. Now, why the federal investigators and the establishment media refuse to acknowledge these facts, we cannot say. Why the BATF refused to answer any questions for 35 days? They were challenged on no one being in their offices that morning. They were finally forced to yield to pressure when a mother who had lost two of her babies in the nursery that day came forward on national television to challenge them, at which time a director District Director Les March from Dallas said that indeed there were five agents in the building. In fact, one of them, their local director, Alex McCauley, 
was riding on an elevator on the eighth floor with the DEA agent. And at the moment of the explosion, they fell to the third floor. But Les Marks lied. Our later investigation proved this. Did Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols really pull off the greatest mass murder in American history? Would a 26-year-old Timothy McVeigh, with just a few years in the military, have the experience and the knowledge to be able to do this? And if so, would he be stupid enough to drive up the highway at 85 miles an hour with no tags on his car? And if he were stopped by the highway patrolman, Charlie Hanger, as he was, would he hesitate to kill one more after murdering 169 people? Why would the President of the United States and his Attorney General make accusations of people and groups around the country, accusations that they knew not to be true? Why did the governor of Oklahoma, Governor Frank Keating, attempt to thwart a member of his own party, Representative Charles Key, who simply wanted and asked for an independent investigation outside of the auspices of the FBI. These are a few of the many, many questions we've been pursuing all summer and will pursue in the next 90 minutes or so. But when we finish, you may have more questions and answers. J.D. Cash is an investigative reporter whom I had the good fortune to meet on my second trip to Oklahoma and who has worked very closely with me on this case. He is a lawyer who at age 40 retired from his business in Tulsa with enough means to pursue his long suppressed desire to be a writer. When the explosions in Oklahoma City captured his attention, he immediately began to investigate the discrepancies in the accepted story, the single blast theory. Now, several of his articles about the contradiction of facts in this tragedy have been published locally, but he began to notice that when his editor submitted his articles to the Associated Press, they continually were being ignored. When he finally inquired in person with AP as to why they were not running his articles, he was told by the bureau chief in Oklahoma City that they had been asked by the FBI not to pursue the Middle East connection. But well, J.D. Cash is a tenacious reporter whose experience in the legal profession long ago taught him not to write anything that he cannot document. He has collected astounding facts that you are yet to hear from your television network news. The so first of May, I started making some phone calls. There were some things that I was saying on the uh, national news that didn't add up and there were some questions or a lot of questions that the national news wasn't even asking and so I started making some phone calls and uh, immediately uh, ran into the assistant fire marshal Dick Miller and uh, Dick uh, I, I wanted to know where the ATF DEA and Secret Service was maintaining their uh, magazines in the building it was my understanding that they did have uh, magazines in that building and I wanted to know where they were located. In the conversation, he explained to me that he had never done a, uh, an inspection of that building because that is a federal building and he's off limits there because of his role as being a city employee. But he did say that he had uh, located or the bomb squad had discovered at around 10.30 a.m. on the day of the bombing a two foot by two foot by two foot box marked high explosives. The box was uh, taken by the Oklahoma City Bomb Squad out to a remote area where it was detonated. His, his exact words were, Mr. Cash, when they detonated that, it was definitely high explosives. No question about it. We have uh, a number of witnesses that actually helped the BATF remove high explosives that were still uh, undetonated from the Mura building after uh, a period of about two weeks. And I have since been able to interview a number of civilians who have told me in interviews on tape on the record that indeed they did help the ATF remove explosives and weapons such as a tow missile, such as hand grenades, uh, cases of uh, munitions marked explosives. Uh, these were removed from the remains of the ATF magazine, which was located on the southeast corner of the Mura building. And interestingly, this room sits atop 
the coned in area, what I call the coned in area, which is the area where most of the victims were found. This is the pit area. But this room sat right up on top of it and was ruptured. J.D., how many people have you actually spoken with who heard multiple explosions that morning? I have talked to so many people who have heard multiple explosions that I have really lost count. Uh, we call them the Two Blast Club. Uh, actually, uh, it's no longer uh, a point of, uh, of dispute, uh, especially when you're interviewing someone who has a military background. Uh, those are the people who, have, uh, especially combat veterans who have been under fire, they're very attuned to explosives. I even talked to a, uh, a demolition expert who was sitting in a cafeteria in Edmond, some 30 miles from the blast site. And it is his custom, when he hears a blast, to use his feet to count the subsequent blast to check for. And he says there was no question there were two blasts that day. And I asked him, I said, well, how would you, why do you use your feet? And he said, well, you can't really trust always trust your hearing and he said the reason why I'm alive today is when we set out multiple charges we use our feet to make sure that all of the charges that we have set off have gone off before we go back and approach the area so it's just automatic speaking of these explosive experts did any of them comment to you on the impossibility of a an ammonium nitrate diesel fuel bomb being capable of doing this kind of damage? To the last person. Every time I interview someone for my articles or for a subsequent book, always uh, at the end of the interview or at some point in the interview, I ask them, what stands out in your mind after having been there that day or during the rescue effort? What's, what's the most uh, amazing thing that you saw? And two out of three times these people say the condition of the building that they had never seen anything so torn to pieces and anyone who has ever been through that building who is willing to be honest will always say look at where the crater is look at where that area that coned in area is it doesn't make any sense obviously there were other explosions in that building that day and that is universal. Michael Hinton was born in Atlanta, but spent much of his early life in England. He works as a lobbyist at the Oklahoma Capitol building. In April, he lived in the YMCA building on Northeast 5th Street, and his daily routine was to catch the city bus that stopped across the street in front of the Murrah building at 8.50 a.m. On the morning of the blast, having just missed his usual bus by a minute, he made a fateful decision. Had he not made the right one, he undoubtedly would have been the 170th person to die in explosions. Mr. Hinton has definite convictions about the question of a second blast. At, uh, I am active with uh, Ross Perot's United We Stand America. I was a federal law enforcement officer for nearly 22 years. That included the military service. And I'm here actively in the Oklahoma City area where I'm continuing my duty and service to my country. April 19th. I uh, just had came out uh, the YMCA, run across the street on the northwest 5th Street in Robinson area, about, uh, I'd say, 50 feet uh, diagonal direction uh, to the federal building. And I'm standing there on the corner that morning waiting for a metro transit bus, and I discovered, it was at 10 minutes till 9 at the time I was standing there, and I discovered I'd missed two buses. So at uh, 8.55 or about 8.56 that morning of April 19th, 95, I run down to Northwest 5th and Broadway. Another bus was coming through the intersection and I caught him just in time. This bus was running late. So, but I got on and went on to the transfer terminal where I was to catch another bus bound for the state capitol. Well, after I gotten off of the bus to transfer on the bus that's headed for the state capitol, uh, and it hadn't even been hardly two minutes before we heard this very violent rumble under the bus. And it occurred two times where the bus rocked on its side twice. And I'd say this occurred uh, about six to seven seconds apart. At that time, none of us knew what was going on. And I commented to the bus driver, I said, my, what was that all about? 
and we thought maybe another bus coming in had crashed into us or lost its brakes or something. So, you know, we were all just sitting there in, you know, a state of shock. Like, you know, we never felt nothing like that. But the bus, you know, something to raise a bus, you know, that much, uh, equipment that heavy. And this interesting thing that the news reporters kept emphasizing on all of the uh, local tele channels is that uh, the Murrow building just had received a bomb threat one week prior to the actual bomb explosion that morning of April the 19th. You had witnessed this, had you not? Yes, I had witnessed. Now, what is interesting is that on a Wednesday, it's been about April 12th, one week exact, before the bombing actually occurred, it was in the afternoon, I would say 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, there was a gathering of, I'd say, it was a 350 to 400 people standing around the, the federal building. I'm looking at me wonder at this, and I'm saying, like, well, what could be going on at the federal building? I said, well, maybe they had a fire drill, maybe there was some type of ceremony going on, but the more I looked and watched this, I watched these people about 30 minutes, and, you know, it didn't appear to anything that was formal, you know, like I said, going on. People were standing there, engaged in conversations and what have you. So I started to go across the street and inquire, and I said, well, maybe it's just one, uh, a fire alarm went off or some, so I paid no more attention to it. But on the morning of the bomb explosion, and they're emphasizing that the Murrow building had received a threat, the thought came to me then, well, what I had observed out my window one week prior, that may have what was going on then. Was there any doubt in your mind or anyone's mind that there were two incidents here, five or six seconds apart? Well, I can't speak for the other passengers. I can only speak for me. What I personally heard and uh, know for myself, that there were two distinct uh, explosions that I heard and the bus uh, responded twice by rocking on its side like it did. In fact, in that second explosion, uh, I thought well, for a while there, the bus is going to turn over. Mr. Hinton has a friend who works in the downtown library just a block behind the Murrah building. It, too, received severe enough damage to close it for several weeks. The two later had a conversation about the matter, and Michael asked him. I asked him, I says, um, where were you on the morning of the bomb explosion? He says, Michael, I was right here in the library. I says, how many explosions did you hear? He said, I heard what appeared to be two distinct explosions and possibly a third. Despite the best efforts of the authorities, the two blast theory rolls on. More witnesses come forward. Jim Ferguson is a heating and air conditioning engineer and a foreman in charge of many of the downtown federal buildings in Oklahoma City. And of course, at one time, the Murrah Building. His office is downstairs in the United States Courthouse. And he was on the scene doing rescue in less than one minute after the explosion. And his version of what happened destroys almost every major point of the government story. When I asked Jim if he had heard two explosions, he answered as if I had naively asked him if he still believed in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. Why, heck yeah, I heard two explosions, he told me. Everybody in town heard two explosions. His wife, sitting at the table, then told us that she and her mother-in-law, Jim's mother, were at the farmer's market, about a mile and a half southwest of the Murrah building that morning. They heard the first explosion, turned to see what was going on, saw a cloud rising from the Murrah building, and about five or six seconds later, she described it, saw a second mushroom cloud rise from the building following a second explosion. ABC Television's Good Morning America wanted to talk to the maintenance crew at, at the federal buildings. Jim Ferguson, of course, was part of that. And all went well until he began to tell about bullet zooming by his ear a half an hour or so after the explosion when he was doing a rescue on a third floor. Cameras began to roll again as excited reporters jumped forward with their pads and pencils to hear this man's story. He said, I was in Vietnam. I know what bullets going by your ear sound like. And they said, what are you talking about? And he explained that the cache of ammunition from the ninth floor where the building had ruptured had dumped into the automobiles down on the ground and the fires there were setting off the ammunition and bullets were zinging by Jim's head. It's made a great story, a human interest story, a blockbuster of a story. But when it got to New York, someone chose to cut the segment, and it was never aired. I asked Jim if he had trouble breathing once he was inside the Murrah building. He said, yes, he was there in less than a minute. In fact, the dust was still rising. I said, what about gas? What about fire? And he was very emphatic and said, there was absolutely no gas, no flames in the Murrah building. 
We spoke with the Fergusons at their home on the night of Wednesday, June 14, 1995. The next afternoon, June 15th, I reported this story over the People's Radio Network nationwide. A few days later, Jim had a visit from two FBI agents. And it was for this reason that he subsequently refused to go on camera with us for this documentary or, or even be interviewed by anyone else. You could call him another witness, intimidated by those who were supposed to be attempting to solve the crime. Now, I'm not an explosive expert by any means, but however, to a man, you should know that every explosive expert from former Navy SEALs to civilian owners of demolition companies that we talked to have all told us that an ANFO bomb that's ammonium nitrate fuel oil, A-N-F-O. An ANFO bomb has two glaring signatures, nitrate gas and fire. Even after the flames are out, you can't go near that scene for an hour or two without a gas mask. If the FBI and the control news media were seriously looking for the real facts of the case, would they not attempt to draw conclusions from the evidence of witnesses such as Jim Ferguson? His testimony not only strengthens the likelihood of there having been multiple bombs on the scene, but all but eliminates the possibility of this damage having been caused by an ANFO explosion. The evidence shows that if there even was an ANFO bomb outside, it was only large enough to cause a diversionary effect, strong enough to destroy not much more than whatever vehicle carried it and maybe some windows but thereby igniting the numerous car fires in immediate proximity and allowing its nitrate gas to dissipate quickly into the open air. According to every independent expert we spoke with, the truck bomb simply could not have been large enough to cause the massive damage seen at the Murrah building. J.D. Cash and I had been wondering how so many ATF agents appeared on the scene so suddenly after the explosion. And if they actually were at work that morning, why were they outside the building and not in their offices on the ninth floor? This became uh, a, a national issue on May the 23rd, on the day of the demolition, when Edie Smith was on CNN following the demolition of the Mira building. And she brought it to the country's attention that she had a lot of questions about what the ATF knew prior to the bombing. You know, we want to know you know, a government agency on the ninth floor who's supposedly the target of the bombing, you know, where none of their employees were in the office that day. I mean, did they have a warning or didn't they? We can't get them to answer. Our Early on, Pat, I assumed that the reason that the BATF was not at their office that day was because possibly just a superstitious thing. It's April the 19th. Their supervisor said, hey, guys, you know, maybe tomorrow isn't a good day to be at work. And they just went went out and uh, uh, played golf or whatever. And uh, about two weeks into this, I started receiving information from witnesses and from concerned citizens asking me to look into this a little bit closer. And as I began to locate individuals uh, that had information about the ATF's whereabouts that day, it became startlingly clear that uh, uh, they were outside of their office that day, but incredibly close to the building. I asked J.D. just exactly what particulars he had uncovered with the witnesses who had been willing to talk. Uh, we have one witness that we've taken down and put in a broadcast uh, uh, theater and uh, put him on tape, on camera, his face blacked out, changed his voice in order to protect him. And this individual has told us that he saw six to eight ATF agents 14 to 16 minutes after the blast working the crater area, working the rubble, looking for bomb fragments outside the mirror building on the morning of the blast. Another witness confronted an ATF agent outside. A, lo a local broadcasting company, a local uh, affiliate, has a witness that they have interviewed on more than one occasion who, along with this person's supervisor, uh, rushed up to the building two minutes after the blast and the first person that that, that person encountered was a jacketed ATF agent. And when I say jacketed, I'm talking about their raid jacket where it's, their initials are clearly marked. This witness told 
the television interviewer that he looked up at the ninth floor. Now this particular person happened to know because of his wife's position with the government, he happened to know that ATF officed in that building. And he pointed up there to the ninth floor, which was largely destroyed, and then looked at this individual and said, how are you alive? And the ATF agent, according to this witness, said, I was told not to come in this morning. We've had a bomb threat. We talked about another witness who was parked on the street only a hundred paces from the Ryder truck. He survived nicely. And it's amazing. When he gets out of the truck and he walks up to the parking lot, the very first group of officers that he sees are ATF agents in their raid jackets. He was amazed. Uh, this, these stories keep coming back over and over and over again. Just exactly where were the agents that morning? We know for a fact that three were in Ponca City at an arson trial. Two more were downtown Oklahoma City at the U.S. Courthouse at a similar arson trial. One, Agent Luke Franey, was on the ninth floor of the Murrah Building. Another, Alex McCauley, the agent in charge, claimed to have been on the elevator, claims to have fallen from the eighth floor to the third floor. Five others were unaccounted for. We wonder, five or six unaccounted for? Les Martz put out a memo to all the ATF and IRS offices across the country saying that Edie Smith's accusations were groundless. That not only were ATF personnel victims, but they were heroes doing rescue. That Alex McCauley went on a five-story free fall in the elevator. But the inspectors at the elevator company said, no way. Uh, none of these elevators had any of the switches thrown, which would be thrown if there had even been an increase in speed of 10%. That's one of the safety features of those elevators in the Mira building. And I asked him, I said, well, what about a free fall? I asked this of three or four or five of these gentlemen. And each one has sort of laughs and says, elevators, the modern ele elevator doesn't free fall. It has a, uh, uh, unless you cut the cables. They have the, the way that they, they have a, uh, a counterbalancing mechanism, which uh, if, if the power goes off, the elevator would be more likely to rise than it would to do anything else. So the idea of an elevator free falling is ludicrous. There were no severed cables in the market. And there were no severed cables. The bottom line is this story, which has been put out in news releases by the ATF, is not correct. It is not accurate. And they should have done a better job than this if they were trying to account for where Agent McCauley was. At the close of our interview, I requested that J.D. Cash give us his summation of what we will call our theory number one. With 3,500 pounds of pressure or more, C4 will be detonated. There's two ways to detonate it. You can either use percussion caps, which is what it's designed for, or 3,500 pounds of pressure. That will set it off. If it went off in that way and took out, the only thing it had to do was take out that one pier. Pier number three is what we call it. And when that goes, there goes eight floors, and there's your pit area, and there are most of your casualties that day. But for sure and for certain, the pit, the, the pit area in that southeast area, that coned-in area of the building, the damage was done by a separate blast. It has no relationship whatsoever to the crater, which is more towards the west. And certainly, uh, if, if the fertilizer bomb could do the damage to the southeast area, it would have done it all the way across to the western area. This is a remote area from the fertilizer bomb, if it was indeed a fertilizer bomb. Representative Charles Key is a 41-year-old businessman and not a lawyer, he's quick to point out, now in his fifth term as a member of the state legislature. Many of the victims' families live in his district, in the western portion of Oklahoma City. Mr. Key sensed there may be an ongoing federal cover-up in this case and attempted to initiate a legislative investigation 
conducted by a House committee. His efforts were swiftly foiled. We, uh, we asked for the Speaker of the House to appoint a special House committee, not a joint Senate House committee, uh, not one created by the governor or anyone else, but a House committee. Because the, the, the nice thing about uh, members of the House, they have two-year terms, they're closely uh, aligned with their constituency because of that, uh, smaller constituency, so typically the House feels a little bit closer to the people and moves a little bit quicker on things. And that's why I ask for uh, a House committee investigation. We asked the Speaker of the House to have an interim committee special investigation. Uh, we do that all the time, like probably most legislative bodies do. We have interim committee studies. So this wouldn't be anything that would be out of, uh, uh, out of the ordinary except the topic involved. And we were flatly turned down, uh, much like the governor said, the speaker said that uh, we should have more faith in the investigative bodies and uh, that any information we had should be turned over to them. And as many people well know, most of the information that we were having problems with and still have problems with today have already been turned over to them. They've, they're already aware of that information. The problem is, is they've been giving an official uh, explanation for some of these elements in what happened on the 19th that don't add up with reality and fact according to many experts. Do you feel like there's some kind of cover-up going from the federal side of the fence? I'm convinced that there are some, at, at the very minimum, there are some in the government that are covering up certain information. Now whether there's a, a big conspiracy, an overall cover-up of some big conspiracy, we don't know. But we all have a right to know, especially the people in this city and this state and the victims and their families that uh, were affected by this. So this was your whole idea in having an independent investigation. Do you think there's any chance of this happening at a later date? It's, it's possible. Uh, frankly, I, I don't have that much faith in our legislative leadership to, uh, to make that decision. To, to turn around a decision that they've already made, unfortunately. What did Governor Keating have to say about the idea? Unfortunately, Governor Keating was very critical when he didn't have to be. Uh, he and I being of the same party, I thought that uh, he would maybe um, adhere to Ronald Reagan's 11th commandment and not be critical of a fellow Republican. But he was somewhat critical of me and my request for the investigation when he didn't have to be. And he's been critical of just about everyone that has brought any questions up about what happened on the 19th and whether there was foreknowledge and a number of other issues. We asked Representative Key if there could have been a Middle Eastern connection. We know that in the first few days after the bombing that there were uh, Middle Eastern or Iraqi individuals that were believed to be involved and that were seen leaving the scene of the crime and that were um, pursued by the authorities and one of those individuals was called John Doe number two and they even put a two million dollar price tag on his head uh, looked for him for a long time and then uh, a couple of months later they decide that uh, there was no John Doe number two at all and uh, we know that there is definitely a Middle Eastern connection in this crime uh, we have other people that I have eyewit given eyewitness testimony, uh, given 100% ID of individuals that were at the scene of the crime, uh, that were of Middle Eastern descent. So we know that there were uh, people uh, involved other than McVeigh that were of Middle Eastern connections. Have you any idea why the FBI would suddenly begin to ignore these people? It has been reported that there are people in Oklahoma City that are former Iraqi soldiers that fought in Saddam Hussein's army in Desert Storm and that at least one of these individuals may be connected to the bombing in some way. Um, I don't know if that's true yet. We need to know if that's true. We need that to be pursued fully and if it is I can see where some individuals may not want that to be made public because of how the public may react to giving asylum to
to Iraqi soldiers that we fought against in a very recent war. And that might be connected to a tragedy like this. That's pure speculation. But we have that information from good sources, and maybe that's part of the reason why uh, this has been swept under the rug, apparently. Indeed, it may have been swept under the rug thus far, but there are private citizens who refuse to let it remain there. Now, what caused those explosions, we don't know exactly. But the people have a right to know what those explosions and, and who was responsible for that damage. Glenn Wilburn is a CPA, and he was in his office 18 blocks north of the explosion site that morning. He was on the scene by 9.20, and remembers the inordinate amount of jacketed BATFHs who were already there. As grandfather of the two Smith boys who died in the nursery, it bothers him that none of the agents had their children there that day. He questions the government story and is very aware of a campaign of disinformation being dispensed by the news media. We talked about this, his concern about the ever-present rumors about the Middle Easterners and the terrified witnesses who are still refusing to come forward with what they know. We were speaking of the infamous John Doe number two. Interesting how he doesn't exist, but yet we have eyewitnesses that saw him. And the FBI's been aware of this since day two. We have four, maybe five witnesses that have ID'd these two being together here in Oklahoma City. It was at the corner of Main Street and Robinson immediately after the explosion. Uh, you have a brown pickup that has two men in it, one of them positively identified as being a Mideastern type man. And uh, this pickup has since been followed. We followed the trail of this pickup, and the FBI have picked this pickup up from a local apartment house complex and this pickup was subsequently spray painted yellow and dumped in this uh, area of this apartment complex and it's it's our understanding the FBI have this pickup and they in fact have said that this pickup was involved in the bombing and it appears to us from witnesses that this pickup was driven and dumped in this parking lot by a Mideastern man looking man again. We have to wonder what is going on here. Why does the FBI not want to admit or to even be investigating the possibility of Mideast connection. And that opens up a whole bag of worms because it appears to me if there's a Mideast connection, it requires a response from Washington, an international response. Now we're into the political spectrum of it. And is it just possible that Washington does not want there to be a Mideast connection? And once again, we have the FBI being an image upholder of Washington. Early in our investigation, witnesses mentioned having been intimidated. I asked if this had been Glenn's experience. I was told that uh, a private investigator in Dallas, Texas, had been told by someone on the inside, and presumably that means someone inside the ATF, that he better not even touch this case. He'd been asked by some people in Oklahoma City to do a little work on this case and ask some questions regarding ATF. And uh, I was told that the uh, person that he talked to said, don't touch it, don't even think about it, and the people in Oklahoma City that are asking questions are gonna be in big, big trouble. During the massive manhunt for John Doe number two, as amazing as it sounds, we got a call from the FBI wanting to inquire about my 14-year-old son, how old he was and where he went to school at, because someone had told them that he looked like John Doe number two. Oh, now he's 14 years old and of course I was livid and uh, I don't know if it's just intentional harassment or if it's simple incompetency on their part but they did have the audacity to call here well we're still grieving over the loss of Chase and Colton and want to know about my 14 year old son the day after Edie's story seemed to expose the ATF's absence the family was paid a visit by IRS, ATF and the United States Attorney but Glenn had a question for them in the short time they were here I said you know, now that we know the significance of April the 19th, we know that to the militia, it is a very important day. There are significant things that have happened before on April 19th, and there was a significant thing happening that day on April the 19th in Arkansas. April the 19th had a lot of symbolism, and I asked them, I said, you know, as professional law enforcement officers, and it's, it's your job to just try to stay up with these things and, and know of times when there's danger. I said, did it not occur to you there could be danger that day? 
that it just might be a bad day somewhere. And of course, both the ATF agents said absolutely not. But very interesting, after the meeting and two hours later at noon, I'm watching television on CNN. And of all things, I see a Mr. Beerball from CNN interviewing John McGall, the head of ATF out of Washington, D.C. And it's kind of deja vu because Beerball asked the exact same question to Mr. McGall that I had asked to the agents in my living room that morning. I was very concerned about that. We did some things here in headquarters and in all of our field offices throughout the, the country to try to be more observant. But it was primarily, uh, we didn't anticipate something like this. We were thinking about, uh, you know, demonstrations uh, and, and things like that. He saw this only two hours after his morning meeting. What were his feelings? I'm assuming they lied to me. Somebody lied to me. Either McGall lied on national TV or the two guys in my living room lied to me. Somebody was lying that morning. Curse me. So were there two blasts or even more? Remembering Jim Ferguson's reply to that question and so many others who agree with him, we have to believe that it is true. Now, we know that it to be a slight exaggeration that everybody in town heard two blasts because many people we interviewed who were inside the Murrah building at the time heard no blasts at all and at first thought they'd been hit by an unexpected tornado. But many more on the outside, such as Michael Hinton on the city bus, heard and felt two definite and separate explosions. Here we have an opportunity for you, the viewer, to be an on-the-scene ear witness. At 9.02 on the morning of April 19th, there was a meeting going on in the conference room of the Oklahoma City Water Board, which was housed across the street and only a hundred feet or so west of the Murrah building. It was so close that people died there in ensuing moments. Now here's a tape recording of that meeting that was taking place. You may decide for yourself how many blasts you are hearing amidst the pandemonium. We begin nine seconds before the explosion. With regard to this proceeding, basically there are four elements that I have to uh, uh, receive information regarding them. postulate that the pop, which can be heard 4.2 seconds prior to the explosion, is a detonator which failed to function. Explosives normally have a backup detonator. We propose that this is what triggered this blast. Experts have stated that the ANFO blast should have lasted five seconds. The recorder had an auto gain control which was activated by the intensity of the sound of the blast. The top of the sound was cut out for almost 10 seconds. Only overlapping explosions could have caused the auto gain control to remain engaged for this length of time. There was at least one other tape recorder operating in the vicinity that morning. An attorney was drafting a letter to his dictating machine at the time. Now, although the lawyer's office was farther away from the scene than the waterboard building, and the fidelity of the recording is not as good, the same details are obvious. A pop precedes explosion by precisely 4.2 seconds on this one, too. This data, of course, is insufficient to reach any firm conclusion. However, it would seem apparent that an event which preceded the truck bombing by 4.2 seconds was recorded at two separate locations in Oklahoma City. This, coupled with the information recorded uh, by the seismograph machines in Norman, should have been cause for further investigation. Dr. Charles Mankin is the man in charge of the Oklahoma Geological Center at Norman, which is 16 miles south from downtown Oklahoma City. His credentials are impeccable. His knowledge of the celebrated seismogram from 9.02 a.m. on April 19th may be surpassed only by that of his colleagues, Drs. Ken Luza and Ray Brown, who also just happened to concur with Dr. Mankin. 
In layman's language, something happened in that event to cause two separate bleeps of some five seconds each to appear on the seismograph. So having that kind of information was puzzling as to why you'd have two separate events that gave a, a virtually identical signals. Dr. Mankin explained that he and his colleagues believed this to be caused by subsurface structures creating a delay in the signal's travel time, thereby reflecting a mirrored event. However, he was quick to point out. So while that explains the rationale for the two different signals, the, we're still left with the issue of how do you explain the duration of each of those signals. The seismic evidence combined with the audio recordings points to a dual explosion larger than possible with a single ANFO bomb. This precludes the theory of McVeigh and Nichols acting alone, unless it can be proven that one or the other was inside the building that morning. Well, part of a disinformation program is to plant individuals and organizations. Uh, this is common. The intelligence community, particularly CIA, is known for coming in on, with cults, planting them there, uh, their own people, uh, provocateurs, having them become leaders of the cult and then control the cult. And also in these disinformation programs, they will plant somebody, that person will be a rabble rouser, it will give the government an opportunity and excuse to come after that particular organization. It's very common. Ted Gunderson is a retired senior special agent in charge of the Los Angeles office of the FBI. Today, he's a private investigator, and renowned trial attorney F. Lee Bailey once dubbed him as unsurpassed by any in the country. Supporting theory number one, we have presented 11 thought-provoking points. With the introduction of Ted Gunderson, we move to our theory number two. Similar to the position of so many others, Mr. Gunderson's lifetime of experience prevented him from believing the news stories about an info bomb being solely responsible for this enormous destruction. Then there was a perplexing situation of John Doe II being seen by so many witnesses that a two million dollar prize tag was placed on his head. In early June, the Justice Department removed this reward offer, with Janet Reno saying at a news conference, John Doe is no longer a suspect. John Doe II is a joke. I mean, the early news report said that John Doe II was seen with McVeigh in Michigan and in Kansas and in Arizona. And now the government comes up and says, oh, and also in, in Kansas he was seen renting the truck with him, right? Now the government's coming up, oh, it's just by coincidence that this particular person that they drew the artist's conception from happened to be in the rental shop at the same time, had nothing to do with McVeigh. And this all doesn't make sense. And now the latest thing, uh, as of this date, is that these are two guys, uh, McVeigh and Nichols, out having a beer, decide they hate the government, went down there and blew up the federal building. That's a joke. Why are the national media ignoring this real information? It appears to be factual that you and General Parton and others are uncovering. They're ignoring you and they are chasing this apparent folly. I don't think they're chasing anything. I think this is uh, part of the disinformation program. I've penetrated... It's by design. It's by design. Investigator Gunderson alleges that he has, with others, infiltrated several clandestine organizations whose modus operandi is to compromise political figures and thereby dictate their voting behavior, a technique that has now been expanded to include key figures in the national news media to further the organization's own agendas. It is clear from Pat Shannon's own research that the national news media are aware of the major differences between the evidence and the official version of events in Oklahoma City. However, they still choose to support the official story. A shabby commentary on the condition of the fourth estate. So as a result, these people, or some of these people, are running the news media. They're paying the bill, so to speak. So they're being, as far as I'm concerned, the major mainstream media is being manipulated, maneuvered by the businessmen. They don't dare come forward with this uh, two detonations and these other theories. Ironically, according to Anthony Summers' new book about your former boss, J. Edgar Hoover, those are the tactics that uh, he became infamous for using from about 1930 to 1970. 
Well, let me put it this way. I'd like to, I, w I don't think we have time to go into J. Edgar Hoover. I will defend him as a, as a great leader, and he put a great organization together. We had no corruption, virtually no corruption at all when he was the head of the FBI. So I don't think we need to get off onto that subject. But I'll say this, that we didn't have the corruption in the... Ted believes that often the national media will pretend to be interested in things that they really are not. April the 26th, I learned that ABC Television and four other members of the media had been into the University of Oklahoma, obtained the information about the two detonations. Then about two weeks later, ABC TV came to town, called me from a motel, said they wanted to interview me and wanted my material. Uh, they couldn't meet, meet with me right at that moment. They said they would talk to me later. And I said, well, in the meantime, I'll fax some material to you at the, ho at the hotel room or the motel room. I did. I never heard from them again. So they never did the interview? They never did the interview. And I think that they were in town just to find out what I had, because this was early in the investigation. And I had uh, been on a number of radio talk shows and so forth. Plus, I sent out, when this initially broke, I sent out a lot of information on my facts. In fact, I probably sent out over 200 uh, faxes around the country. It was picked up and re rerun. Also, it was on the Internet. But it was, they didn't want to interview me. They didn't want this, they only wanted this information to find out what I had, as far as I'm concerned. And ABC TV had this information earlier. They had never used it. Uh, as, the two detonations were mentioned, I understand, on one occasion on CNN. But they haven't been uh, uh, used since then. Ted, it appears that the only way people are able to get the truth from this whole fiasco is from the underground network, so to speak. It seems that even the people in the highest echelons of government are participating in some kind of cover-up. Do you agree with that? I agree 100 percent. We furnished our material to Senator Arlen Specter early in the investigation. I sent him a fax. I said, I'm former number two man in the Philadelphia FBI. I was there when you were U.S. attorney, and I, I met him in the past when he was there at the U.S. And I said, I have some very important critical information for you. Please contact me. I haven't heard from him yet. This is several months ago. So, also, also the FBI. We furnished this information to the FBI. About uh, 10 days after I furnished it to the FBI, I received a phone call. The agent said, uh, I received this fax. You want me to send it to other FBI field officers around the country? I said, well, you can do what you want to do. I sent about 200 on them out. I don't think it's going to matter make any difference one way or another now. Uh, but in the end, the bottom line was he wanted to know where I lived and what my phone number was and so forth. And I said to him, hey, please come out and interview me. Because I, I not only want to talk about this, I want to talk about some of the other things I'm involved in. The only responsible person, quote unquote responsible, who has contacted me or done any follow-up that I furnished this report to is Stephen Jones, McVeigh's attorney. A nice letter back from him. You will be contacted in the future and so on and so forth. And as a matter of fact, these investigators have already interviewed my associate and me. Nationally syndicated talk host Anthony Hilder compared the Oklahoma bombing to the Reichstag fire in Germany in 1933, which was committed by one political faction and successfully blamed on the opposition. Hilder was one of the first to interview Ted Gunderson after the Oklahoma City tragedy. Is this something that occurred uh, as a result of talk show hosts like myself uh, inspiring uh, some crazies to get out there and take out a federal building or is this not in fact something that was set up for the purpose of frightening the population of this of this nation into surrendering our rights for a new world order I have to say in all honesty in all sincerity there's no question in my mind, and this is my opinion, that an incident was occurred or was established or happened that was planned, and the purpose of that was to enrage the American public and two, to make sure and force Congress to pass anti-terrorism legislation, which we do not need, but which at the same time would imperil our civil liberties and further erode our civil rights and help destroy what we believe in our Constitution. Uh, you know, they're, they're uh, encouraging and asking that new legislation be passed, anti-terrorism mm -hmm. legislation. I have with me the guidelines uh, of the uh, uh, current guidelines of the FBI in investigating terrorist acts. 
these guidelines are more than adequate to investigate what we have uh, any potential now, acts in the future. Will you say that right into the camera? Yeah, these, these guidelines, these guidelines here are more than adequate to investigate any terrorist group, uh, domestic or foreign, that comes into the United States. There's no question about it. I've reviewed them. I haven't had an opportunity to review these in 15 years. I reviewed them just the other day. They just would work perfectly. There's no problem with it. There's no reason for any new legislation. For nearly 30 years, you were on one side of the fence, and then suddenly you're coming out on the other and actually uh, accusing your, your former employers. Why are you doing this? For 45 years, 28 years as an uh, FBI agent, and 16 years or 15 years since, I've never changed positions. I've always been on the right side. I'm the seeker of the truth. When I was in the FBI, I sought the truth. When I got out, I still seek the truth. So it's not me being against the FBI. I'm against anybody who is not being honest. Ex-Bureau Chief Gunderson fears that certain people in the government are intentionally withholding and diverting information. Now, we apparently have an element within the government. I don't want to chastise the whole government. But we apparently have an element within the government that doesn't feel this way. And they're putting out this disinformation. And I think it's a horrible situation. I think someone needs to really delve into it. There are some good people in the government, too, so I don't want to chastise all of them. You left the FBI at a relatively early age. I would presume you were probably in your 50s after nearly 30 years. Uh, why did you retire so young? Were you, were you under a cloud of any type, or was there some kind of corruption that you couldn't to stomach within the FBI at the time? No, no, I've, I've never been involved in any corruption. knew of no corruption when I was in the FBI. It was a very a great organization. I had a fantastic career. I'd get up in the morning and shave and I'd say, I can't believe they're paying me to go to work today. That sort of thing. And I retired because I was 50 years of age and I had mandatory retirement at age 55. So I said, well, why should I wait another five years? I'll get out now. And I did. The only problem I've had since I got out is there's been a disinformation program aimed at me by unknown sources within the government. Like I've been accused of being a homosexual and being involved in suffering from mental problems and being forced out of this mental employee, that sort of thing. None of it's true, absolutely not. Mike Ricardo Shooter is probably one of the 12 most brilliant men on earth. A... This man is known to us only as Ray, and he agreed to go on our cameras only on the condition that his face be shattered. He was recruited into the CIA by a 20-year veteran operative to work with one Michael Reconosuto. They were to build portable electronics labs to intercept communications. These were highly technical and sophisticated command posts known as C3I, which stood for Communication, Command, Control, and Intelligence. We're being fed the information secretly, and we know what's going on. Uh, I would prefer believing General Parton's explanation than, than the, the, the ANFO explosion. Of course, we have our own definition of what happened. Their own definition of what happened is a super bomb which has been touted for months by Ted Gunderson on talk radio. Now, the way our pineapple bomb works is that a cloud of, of, of uh, aluminum uh, silicate, lead azide, and a few other ingredients is set up so that a, a specific chain molecule uh, exists and permeates the air all the way around the pillars and so on and so forth. And this cloud is energized with a high voltage pattern, a specific high voltage pattern, which produces a, a sort of a stairway pattern in the molecular structure of the cloud. Part of that pattern is a hydrodynamic generator, a, a, a hydrodynamic power generator, uh, uh, energy, an energy source, uh, shall we say, permeating the cloud, which is then energized with another energy source and then it's detonated and this causes the cloud itself to explode in such a fashion so that if there if it's if, if the cloud is circulating around the pillar then it crushes the pillar from all sides and turns that pillar literally to dust and leaves only the rebar behind so if you've got this cloud permeating all the way around the first floor wherever it is anything in its past gets crushed imploded to dust instantaneously and when that happens of course 
there's nothing left to hold up the store the floor is above so bang they come down like a bang how does this coincide with the five or six second differential seen on the seismograms from Oklahoma Geological Center well uh, the uh, the, the delay in the two detonations is very critical. In fact, it's one of the most critical aspects of the bomb that gives it away. And so I'm not going to comment how accurate the seismographic delay is. I'm going to say that it's within the accuracy range that it should be to fit a bar or bomb signature. Could your bomb have been numbers two and three that people heard? Absolutely. In fact, that's what I'm proposing that happened. The number one was the ANFO, number two was the, the setup explosion, and number three was the final detonation. Michael Riccardo He's currently serving a 30 year sentence in the South Carolina Federal Penitentiary. He and Ted Gunderson have been acquainted for more than 15 years. They worked together on cases that resulted in five murder convictions. Michael Reconosuto is one of the developers of the barometric bomb. However, he claims that in 1991 he was framed on drug charges by factions in the government in order to get rid of him. His documentation of being drug clean and company tests for years prior to his arrest tends to substantiate this. Investigator Gunderson and I traveled to a federal penitentiary in South Carolina. We wanted to talk with Michael Reconosuto about his drug conviction and also about this super bomb, which the government denies exists. Looking at uh, General Parton's uh, photographs, uh, they very dramatically show the uh, uh, elements of the structural steel rebar protruding in the uh, uh, bomb uh, debris. And this is a type of damage that is not possible with an ammonium nitrate fuel oil or ANFO type of bomb. An ANFO bomb has a lot of gas pressure and very little brisance or, or shattering power. And at the range that that bomb was uh, detonated, to uh, do that type of structural damage this far into the structure, here you can see on the columns here uh, the pieces of rebar completely exposed. Ordinarily it would take an ex a contact type explosive to uh, do that kind of uh, damage. We ask about telltale signs. The uh, signature is one of blast damage or shattering power, which uh, is characteristic of uh, a very high order explosive. Um, the uh, detonation velocity of our bomb is in excess of 20,000 meters per second. There is no known chemical explosive that has uh, that much brisance. It is a type of uh, uh, explosive uh, detonation device which is developed out of the nuclear weapons program. And uh, this is not your garden variety uh, detonator circuit that you would find in, say, the DuPont Blasters Handbook which is the uh, Bible of the uh, commercial explosives industry. Even in ordinary conventional military explosives, you would not find a detonator of this sophistication. The only place uh, you find this sophistication is in nuclear weapons uh, triggers. Are you then saying this was a nuclear weapon? No, uh, this uh, is detonated by the type of uh, device which is used to initiate a nuclear weapon which is non-nuclear uh, in and of itself. Rikana Sudo believes that there are no conventional explosives in existence capable of doing the kind of damage evident at the scene. Ted, uh, this building was rated uh, better than seismic zone one. And any engineer familiar with the basic Rorick uh, uh, equations uh, on uh, uh, stress, uh, structural stress, would be able to tell you that this damage pattern is very unusual. And for a conventional explosive to do this kind of damage where there's a marked demarcation from class A to class C damage, in other words, total destruction to moderate uh, damage, uh, it, it's just a technical impossibility. It would take a, uh, a blast wave of extreme uh, br brisance 
or, or, or shattering power to do that kind of uh, damage. It's obvious from the public reports that there were two uh, separate blasts. And it's also obvious in uh, publicly that enhanced explosives uh, are uh, of a two-stage or long induction type uh, explosion. Uh, there are, however, certain details uh, which are classified. And uh, this type of knowledge is highly specialized. And your average person on the street, or even your average explosives engineer, would not be aware of uh, uh, this type of technology. When was this bomb developed? Uh, this bomb was uh, developed in the late 70s uh, through our company, Pyrotronics uh, Corporation, which was the parent company of Hercules Research. And then we went into a joint venture with the Wackenhut Corporation. In order to demolish a building like that, uh, a building that is designed for better than seismic zone one uh, stresses, would take in a, an immense amount of rigging, and you would have to actually drill the uh, the uh, structural members to uh, plant the charges. Is this bomb, uh, the barometric bomb, a directional bomb? Uh, yes, it, 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 the uh, blast dispersion uh, can be precisely controlled. It can be omnidirectional or it can be very directional in, in less than 15 degree fan. If, the, if it's uh, detonated that way. Michael, assuming that uh, it, the building was drilled and wired, could it have been done from closing time on Tuesday night before 9 o'clock in the morning Wednesday? Absolutely not. Uh, it would have taken days to, uh, to prep a building like that. Does this bombing fit the signature of any other bomb other than the barometric bomb? None that I know of. Do you have any knowledge of the barometric bomb ever having been used before other than during experimentation? Uh, yes, it was uh, used to take down uh, a uh, high-rise uh, uh, apartment building in downtown Re uh, Beirut in retaliation for uh, Mr. Buckley's uh, torture and death. What year? Uh, that would have been in 1984. 84. And, and, and who was responsible for that? Who had control of the bomb at that time that did this? Uh, I. I you are our, our friend. I don't want to. I don't. I don't. Turn, turn the camera on. In 1989, Michael Ricana Suto's laboratory was burglarized and the top secret barometric bomb prototype was taken. He believes that the drugs were planted at this time which led to his conviction and 30-year sentence in 1991. This has become known as the Aberdeen burglary. Mike, what would tie the Aberdeen burglary into the Oklahoma City bombing? The, uh, shortly uh, after the uh, bombing in Oklahoma, I talked to a Treasury Department agent, and he told me that microtagants from the devices that were stolen in the Aberdeen uh, burglary showed up in the bomb debris. He said the uh, lab at uh, San Francisco, the forensic uh, testing lab the Treasury Department has in San Francisco found it. Is there any way that more than one of your bombs, we'll call it, could have been used at the Murrah building? They wouldn't have taken more than one. So you're saying one could have done the damage that we see, two would have done much more than we see? Ab absolutely. One would have. I'm, I'm surprised that uh, so little damage was done. The microtagants are required by law in commercial explosives uh, in the United States, and they're like a serial number, and they will survive a, uh, a blast. And that way, the forensic uh, uh, bomb investigators can recover bomb uh, blast debris and identify the source of the explosive if it was a commercially made explosive uh, in the United States. The uh, components that we were using in our uh, research program were required to have microtagants in them in case anything uh, ever uh, happened to them where they got into the wrong hands. Your contacts in ATF, have they told you that this is the bomb that could be traced back to Aberdeen, Washington? They told me that the microtagants from the uh, detonators that were reported stolen in the police report that we filed that Raymond and Carl Worth had the file with the Aberdeen Police Department are the, are the ones that uh, showed up there specifically. In the Oklahoma City bomb? Yes.
if the testimony from these ex government agents is true it points to a much more ominous bomb being present at the murrow building on april nineteenth nineteen ninety five Theory number two, then, is a super bomb, no larger than a pineapple, apparently maintained by the CIA, planted either in the truck or inside the building, and detonated from a remote location by a person or persons unknown. Brigadier General Ben Parton of Alexandria, Virginia. He holds a distinguished service medal. He's twice received the Legion of Merit. He was a distinguished graduate of the Air War College. He holds two master's degrees and is a candidate for a PhD. His expertise over most of his 31-year career in the United States Air Force was demolition, and he headed up the Explosives Research Laboratory for the Air Force. He knows how buildings fall and what the identifying signs are as evidence of detonation after they have fallen. He could tell immediately from nothing more than pictures and magazines that the American people were not being told the truth about the Oklahoma City tragedy. In mid-May, a seven-page letter went from the retired Air Force General to Senator Don Nichols of Oklahoma, imploring the Senator to take steps to stop the demolition of the Murrah Building on May the 23rd. To allow this building to be demolished would be tantamount to the commission of another crime. At a minimum, it would be destruction of evidence, said the former high-ranking military officer. We caught up with General Parton in Albuquerque, where he was presenting all these findings on the subject to a large audience at the University of New Mexico. And my, my forte and interest has been in the weapons business for many, many years. And when I saw the circulated, published information about the bombing in Oklahoma, I just knew there was something phony about it. Number one, the pictures were grossly asymmetrical, and you just don't get that with uh, bomb damage. Uh, the level of damage for the size of munition they were talking about was incompatible with the damage to the building. And I got gathered all the information that I could, all the pictures that I could, uh, all the stuff that was published, and I sat down and got the floor plan for the building and as much information as I could on the building structure, and I came to the conclusion that there had to have been demolition charges in the building. There's no way you could have, ha no way what happened down there could have happened without demolition charges in the building. And I knew that those demolition charges had to be on three specific columns. But I felt across the front, if it had been an outside job, that those demolition charges would have been at the base of the columns on the front of the building because they were available and accessible to the, anyone on the sidewalk. But there was one column back in the middle of the building that came down, and it certainly couldn't have been uh, taken out with the demolition charge without someone having access to the building. So I prepared a memorandum and I sent it to about 60 members of the Senate and the House, laying out my concern. And Don McElvaney and I got on the radio talk shows. We both agreed we would hit as many as we possibly could and try to get the Senate and the House to take some action to keep that building from coming down until we could have an independent assessment of what happened. Because I knew when that building came down, there would be evidence uh, forever destroyed. And I suspected that there may be an effort to cover up things, so I felt that we ought to have a separate and independent investigation. Of course, the Senate and the House both acted with their normal black hole kind of an operation. I got, I never did hear from uh, Senator Nichols from Oklahoma. I got a letter back from Senator Warner espousing his wholehearted support for a number of the conditions in the so-called anti-terrorism bill. And Congressman Frank Wolf sent back a letter, and I knew him well, and he said, Dear Ben, 
Thank you for your info copy. It was addressed to him. He said, what you're discussing is above my level of expertise. I have sent it to the FBI for the information and an assessment and evaluation. <laughs> I then knew that he didn't understand what the letter was all about. Disgusted with the attitude of Congress and dissatisfied with the government's clumsy explanations, General Parton personally carried his investigation to Oklahoma City. There's a company in Oklahoma that had pictures that were made throughout the cleaning up of the building. They called, hauled over 315 truck, ton truckloads of material away from that building, hauled it out to a landfill, smashed it down with the equipment as much as they could, covered it up with dirt, put it behind a chain link fence with guards on the gate. So if that's not a figurative and a literal cover up, I don't know what is a cover up. Was this destruction of evidence precipitated because the government prosecutors feared the remaining forensic evidence might clear their official suspects, McVeigh and Nichols? Or would it have proven ATF, DEA, and Secret Service carelessly stored dangerous explosives on the 8th and 9th floors? General Parton feels the photographic evidence disputes the last half of this theory. And here is the stub of column B3. And the top of that column is at the third floor level. And if you examine that column closely, you can see that the rebar is still sticking out the top. And it has all the appearance of a demolition charge, the kind of damage you would get from a demolition charge at the top of that column, where it had a juncture with floor number three. General, would you explain to us the particulars, uh, what your message is, what are you trying to get across? Well, I'm trying to show with this layout of the building structure the pattern of damage that was done to the building from whatever was doing damage. And uh, what I found that you had uh, demolition charges in the building plus the truck bomb outside. Now this is the pressure pattern that you would get from the truck bomb located in this position. And that's about the size of the explosive charge of 4,800 pounds of ammonium nitrate with enough fuel on it. And even though you had about a half a million pounds out here per square inch, by the time the, that pressure wave got to the first point of contact with the building was right here, you're down to about 375 pounds per square inch. Now the columns with the X's you've marked are on the third floor. The, co the columns with the X's I've marked are the columns that I concluded were taken out by demolition charges. At the third floor level? At the third floor level. A blast. There was a blast from the truck bomb. There was? There was a blast from the but truck bomb. But not strong bomb. enough to damage the header or blow it in. That's right. But, but the, uh, as I indicated, there is the evidence from the pictures that show that these columns were failed by demolition charges. With evidence inside, was it really necessary to destroy the Murrah building? General Parton asked that question, too. And I talked to the architect, as I indicated before, and the architect told me, and this is the one who was there supervising and advising on shoring up the building. He said the building that was standing was sound. It was his recommendation that the building be rebuilt because everything still standing was structurally sound and he felt the building could be rebuilt. Pat Shannon asked General Barton if this could have been a staged event in order to accelerate the passage of anti-terrorism legislation currently before Congress, which, if passed, would undermine American civil rights. These are his conclusions. They were federalizing crime in this country when the Constitution clearly leaves it in the local level, in the state level. They were giving the FBI and the BATF and any law enforcement agency in this country a powers over the American people that the American people had never, never seen before. It's the same kind of power over the people that the uh, Gestapo in Germany was exercising and the KGB in Russia were exercising. And I just didn't want to see that imposed on the people in this country. Now we come to our third and final theory. 
Three columns on the front row and one in the second row were taken out with four strategically placed charges. As in theory number two, the ANVO bomb outside in the truck was no more than a diversionary tactic and did little damage. So we have three possible scenarios now. Three situations that could have happened. None of which fits into the government's cover story of a single ANVO explosion on the street and of Tim McVeigh acting alone. However, we believe we can correctly assume that there was an ANVO bomb that exploded in a truck outside the Murrah building. So at this point, we must suppose that one of three things happened. First, Tim McVeigh, along with John Doe II, whoever he is, and acting in concert with absolutely no one else at the scene, parked the truck loaded with explosives, ignited it at the scene with the fuse or from a remote location moments later, and set off the blast. They were not aware that explosives had been stored on the ninth floor by DEA, BATF, and the Secret Service. The truck explosion on the outside triggered the cash on the inside a few seconds later. This would account for the multiple explosions heard by hundreds of witnesses and even captured on tape, as well as the two separate shakes on the seismograph, five seconds apart. One can imagine the embarrassment, not to mention the liability, the agency would shoulder if these facts became public knowledge. Therefore, it was in the best interest of the government to demolish the building to prevent any further investigation. But we know also from the unanimity of opinion of a multitude of experts that this alone could not have sheared the columns and cut this kind of pattern through the structure. Therefore, we must eliminate this supposition almost as quickly as we consider it. The second and third possibilities involve more intrigue and provide even a more sinister answer to the question of why this gigantic effort at a cover-up. Now let us assume for a moment that John Doe II is leading Tim McVeigh around by the nose, coercing him into buying the fertilizer, renting the truck, etc. But John Doe II is also working closely with the government, relaying all the information to them, unbeknownst to Tim McVeigh, of course, Tim, then, is the inveterate and the classic patsy, much as was Lee Harvey Oswald in 1963. So when the truck bomb goes off at 902, the barometric super bomb described by Gunderson Ray and Ricana Sudo is triggered by a Confederate in an unmarked helicopter, which was seen above the building by several witnesses at the time of the explosion. On the surface, this theory seems to have merit, but it simply does not and cannot fit again the pattern of destruction. In an attempt to show that perhaps both Gunderson and General Parton were correct, that several super bombs were strategically placed, as Parton was suggesting, we asked Michael Reconosuto if this could be. He vetoed the idea immediately. His barometric bomb was just far too powerful. Any more than one of these bombs would have left far more devastation than we already see. In our third case scenario, we had the conditions presented by General Parton and the facts seem to make his the strongest case of all. Remember, he's a bona fide demolition expert from the United States Air Force, and of the precise ilk the government would have brought forward a long time ago if his testimony had been favorable to them. Of course it's not. His scenario could have included Tim McVeigh only on the fringes at best, and certainly not the mastermind. You see, both General Parton and the BATF are very aware that if Parton is correct, and he is certain that he is, it would have to involve duplicity at the highest levels of government. Those columns could not have been drilled and wired and those charges so strategically placed without a team on the inside. Some say that this would have taken several days and not feasible because the activity would have been witnessed by too many people. The general pardon says the columns did not have to be drilled and wired, not even wrapped, he says. He says a bucket full of C4 or C5, maybe a cubic foot in size and weighing about 60 pounds. Placed next to the columns he's identified would have had the sufficient power to shear those columns, turn the concrete to powder, and leave only the rebar as evidenced. This operation could have been performed in 10 minutes, said General Parton. And we found that to be interesting. The building foreman told us that there was no security in the Murrah building after 11 o'clock at night.
when the cleanup crew left. Only a night watchman who patrolled the area around the U.S. courthouse. Now with proper timing and Watergate fashion, it would have been a simple matter for those with keys and knowledge of the alarm system to enter, place the charges, and then be gone from the area before the watchman returned on his routine rounds. If the truth is ever known, we agree with General Parton that of the three, this supposition will prove to be the closest to that truth. There were other innocent victims of this tragedy. First, the President and the Attorney General jumped to outrageous conclusions and seemed to make whatever public accusations that might prove to be politically expedient. They blamed in general the Christian right and in particular the conservative talk show host and the unorganized state militia. The charges were all groundless, but because of the source, the news media had a field day for many days. One of these unfortunate victims was James Nichols of Decker, Michigan, the older brother of Terry. In the heat of the hysteria, the public sat back in wonderment as James was arrested without charges, indicted on flimsy circumstantial evidence, and placed in a federal lockup for 32 days. He was finally released when prosecutors admitted that there was nothing on which they could base a case against this man. They arrested me. First it was, it was protective custody. I, I argued with that. I objected to that. Then, then they drew, brought up charges upon me, you know, falsely. Uh, indicted me with a grand jury indictment the day before we was going to have a probable cause hearing because they didn't have any evidence for a probable cause hearing. So they used the prosecutor's grand jury rubber stamp. Uh, afterwards, they let me out. I finally, after three court hearings, the judge said that they, he sees no evidence. They presented no evidence to connect me. And then Janet Reno come on last Thursday, the 10th of August, I think it was, said that I'm totally exonerated, I had no evidence. Well, if, I didn't, if they didn't have any evidence after another 60 days of surveillance and investigation, how did they have enough evidence to put me in prison to start with? Another tawdry example of the victimization of survivors is the Edie Smith and Kathy Wilburn story. So then all the letters that you received from the Red Cross, none had any money in it. No, they didn't. And they were open no matter how it was addressed. And this beca it became a concern to me because there was such a massive volume of mail. And I was wondering, why were they opening our mail? So I called them. I picked up the phone and called them. Uh, the first person I talked to said, Dad, we don't open the mail. I said, well, ma'am, you know, I wouldn't make up this story or lie to you. I said, uh, our mail is certainly being opened. And they referred me to Dee Jackson, the head lady of Red Cross, as I understand it, here in Oklahoma City. And she said, we don't open the mail. And I said, well, our mail is being opened. Can you, you know, and she said she'd check into it. When I talked back with her, we were told uh, that they she would put a stop to them opening the mail but the mail was being opened because they were protecting us from hate mail red cross was afraid that uh since edie had had two children murdered that people were going to send hate mail to her did that ever occur no who would write hate mail to someone that had their children murdered we never got one unkind letter to the people that took the time to write to us were people that were wanting to console us and extend their sympathies there was never any hate mail. It has been said many times that those that do not know the past are condemned to repeat it. But how will we ever understand this incident in the recent American past if we are confined to the headline version, which seems to be designed for public consumption in the interests of protecting a few very powerful people? And while we cannot yet be sure of what did happen that dreadful morning, these months of research for this documentary have made us absolutely certain of at least two issues. Firstly, a single ANFO explosion in a truck outside the building was not solely responsible for the enormous destruction and unprecedented loss of life. Secondly, as General Parton wrote to Congress, the effort required to mastermind and execute this intricate operation does indeed pale in comparison with the effort taken to cover it up. We must agree with Chuck Harder's opening statement. There is something very wrong with the Oklahoma story. 
Mr. Johnson? Yeah, the, um, first it's a question about uh, blowing up a building. Are there any circumstances under which an individual is justified to blow up any building? After you've evacuated it and you wanted to cover up the evidence, TV. Imagine a TV and radio network actually supported and guided by everyday Americans. People who, like you, are fed up, really care about their families, and want a chance at the long-lost American dream. The honest and hard-working citizens across the USA. The real heroes and heroines. Folks, this is your show. It's for the people. We'll help you survive this thing called life. we for the Hoppy Heidelberg is a horse breeder and president of a horse breeders association. He's a businessman in Oklahoma. What do you care? He also was a member of the grand jury of the Oklahoma bombing, and he says, guess what? It's a bigger deal than what they say. He's coming up next. Some very big news in the Oklahoma bombing matter, uh, starting off with USA Today newspaper. A little cut line on the front, it said, Oklahoma bombing some grand jurors dozed during key testimony, says dismissed grand juror making waves with comments on how case was shaped. Well, that's how you sanitize it and kind of take the blow out of it. And then the story, of course, on page 3A, former juror impugns bomb case proceedings and hints apparently in the copy of something much much more we have the gentleman on the line with me right now hoppy heidelberg how are you i'm fine good what do you want to tell america what happened in that grand jury room and and what is the the straight skinny on this oklahoma bombing well and nobody knows the straight skinny at least i don't that's just what i'm trying to find out okay my whole purpose for going public is to try to you know force the issue and let's find out what's going on what what can you say, and what has you upset? Well, I can't. Uh, you understand, I can't uh, say anything that, about what actually happened uh, during the proceedings of the grand jury because that's secret. Uh, but uh, you know, it, I don't have a problem with telling you what didn't happen, and, I, and, and really, what didn't happen is probably more upsetting than what did happen. Okay. Um, I, we didn't receive as, uh, nearly as much evidence uh, in the grand jury room as, as you could get reading the paper. And I thought that kind of strange. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, if I wanted to find out anything about the bombing, I was better off reading the local paper than listening to the testimony. Mm -hmm. so, so what you're saying is that, is that you were not given good information. Why would you think that would be? 
Well, I think that's the $64,000 question. That's just what I'm trying to find out. Why, 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 why was everybody else having more luck than the FBI researching this thing? Well, uh, let me ask you a couple of questions. Uh, did it ever come out, or, or can you comment, a as to any kind of delays that occurred in the rescue operation? Was that ever talked about, or can you comment on that? No, I'm not, I don't know anything about that. Okay, what about uh, other stuff found in the building, such as uh, uh, explosives or what have you? Did, did they talk about that, or can you comment on that? No, there's not going to be any discussion about anything like that. Okay. Uh, can you comment, uh, or what? what is your concern, or uh, I don't know quite how to word it, but in the newspaper here, in the USA Today, it says uh, that you, uh, uh, you're concerned that prosecutors did not provide information about the possible involvement of others in the case, particularly a suspect referred to as John Doe II. When you add others in the case and suspect John Doe II, you have a conspiracy, don't you? Well, there's some evidence that there were a number of people involved. The only evidence that I've actually heard is, uh, and the only physical description I have of mm -hmm. any of the other parties is, is John Doe too. Is his physical description is <laughs> he's a rather unique person, and there's only one like him, and everybody seen him describes him the same way. So we sure know he exists. We don't know about the others. Okay, if John Doe too exists, as you said, as you say, he does. And as you know, KFOR-TV and local journalists uh, have done a tremendous amount of, of looking into John Doe too, and, and we even purchased for a, a rather decent amount of money some reports from KFOR-TV that indicated that John Doe too was seen around Oklahoma City. What, what can you talk to about that? Well, I'm, that's, there's plenty of... I, I'm satisfied he probably has been seen a lot of places by a lot of different people. And uh, we just weren't allowed to talk to him, and I, I find that strange. What did the prosecutors essentially tell you that this was not important, or that you were not to talk to him? No, that all my questions would be answered before we were asked to indict. Just relax, lay back. Uh, you know, you're in good hands with Allstate. Just <laughs> go along for the ride, and, and we'll we'll work it out. It'll, it'll all be all right in the end. Were your questions answered? No, they weren't. So what you're saying is, as a grand juror, you're very upset because the process was not pure. Is that what you're saying? Well, it didn't work. And, uh, you know, I mean, as far as the, the, in, the indictments we got, it worked. But that's, I thought a grand jury was supposed to investigate. Well, you and I both know that a grand jury is supposed to investigate, and a grand jury is supposed to ask questions. But you're telling me that your questions went unanswered and that you did not get... Uh, uh, cooperation is that is that what you're saying? Uh, that'd be an accurate description. I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but but are you saying that there was any kind of a cover up by prosecution or a lack of prosecution or or a withholding of prosecution? That's what I'm trying to find out. And obviously, you never will now because they kicked you off the panel. Well, unless there's an, an uh, another investigation that turns up evidence of any such things that you're discussing. When K I mean, we need another investigation is what we need. Okay, when KFOR-TV and other reliable local media that have, have been doing excellent jobs come out with all kinds of, of uh, leads on not only John Doe 2, but something that indicates a wider uh, conspiracy or organization and, and perhaps even maybe a rogue element here or there from the government, why are the, why was such things not investigated by the authorities? Why would that be overlooked? Can can you give us any kind of a thought on that? Yeah, I, I can give you a thought on that. They had so many agents investigating the families of the victims, the reporters in town, the, and, and like now they're investigating me. They didn't have enough agents left to investigate the bombing. So what you're saying is that they are essentially intimidating anybody who doesn't want to go along with the government line? Is that what you're saying? Well, <laughs> A lot of people would agree with that. Uh, that's been reported. A lot of people have reported to me that they've been intimidated, mm -hmm. and, and you know, and, and they're trying to, sh you know, hushed up, keep their mouth shut, quit bucking the system, quit trying to find out what happened. And uh, since I became public, why then a lot of people, I get a lot of calls, and a lot of them are families of the victims, a lot of them are reporters, a lot of them are just people in town that have been warned, you know, and uh, I just find it all very strange.
All right, Hoppy Heidelberg, you are 55 years of age, and you are president of, uh, of a horse breeders association, amongst other things. Apparently, you're a businessman, are you not? Right. All right, yeah. so you, you are not just some cuckoo that they, they picked up on Skid Row and said, here, boy, you're a grand juror. You're obviously a responsible guy. Uh, why in the world can you, can you tell me what you think is going on? Not at this time, I really can't. Uh, uh, it's just, uh, you know, everybody has ideas, but I'd rather not expound on what I think is going on uh, because I really don't know what's going on. What I'd rather do is find out what's going on. How would you propose that be done? <sighs> well, enough pressure was finally put on the Ruby Ridge situation that it... Uh, It's kind of coming clean, and uh, enough pressure. Maybe we find out what really happened at Oklahoma City. How would you propose the pressure be put on the government to come clean? Well, I would think the American people, they've got incentive to clear this thing up, because if they don't clear this one up, there could be more. So if you don't find out who all bombed the Oklahoma City building, why, any city could be next. So they've got the incentive. They should be motivated to find out who and gather up everybody that was involved in the Oklahoma City bombing and get them off the street. You're talking about the American people should do this. Yeah, well, it's the only people who can. Well, why are the authorities not doing this? That's their job. Well, <laughs> there's no pressure on them to do their job. That's what I say. The American people has to put pressure on the authorities to do their job. Uh, I mean, you... <laughs> A lot of people have jobs they don't do. They just draw their pay. All right, we, we got a two-minute break, and, and when we come back, I'd like to ask you a couple of other questions about what you wanted to tell America about and why you did this. Don't go away. MTV is a vehicle used to shape the minds and hearts of children. Imagine your child reenacting Beavis and Butthead by setting fire to your house. For the People presents a stunning three-level investigative report on MTV and Hollywood. What's the true intention of this media giant? How can you save the minds of your children from the sewage being pumped into your home? This report will shock you. By becoming a For the People member, you can take advantage of this special inside look into the minds of those who deliberately manipulate our children. This video offer is a $79.95 value that we'll give you for only $7.95 plus $4 shipping and handling. Plus, you'll receive absolutely free the latest copy of the For the People News Reporter. MasterCard, Visa, Discover, and American Express accepted. To order, call 1-800-888-9999 for MTV, Hollywood's Lie. We're talking to the man that uh, USA talked to, USA Today, and uh, he is a former juror, a former grand uh, jury member at the Oklahoma bombing case. His name is Hoppy Heidelberg. Uh, the Associated Press ran a story a couple of days ago, Hoppy, where they said that you wanted to tell America something, you wanted to get the word out. Specifically what? Well, a lot of things are run in the paper, you know, that uh, are opinions of people other than me. Okay. I mean, it's not so much that I want to get the story out, is that I want to, uh, I guess the story I would put out is that the American people need to resume 
the responsibilities that was uh, were given to them originally, and because when they abdicate responsibilities, uh, vacuums don't exist long, and uh, the government's all too willing to move in. Right, let, let, let's 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 go back to that. Uh, yeah. specif specifically, what responsibilities do you say that the American people have that they are not pursuing? Well, let's just pick on grand juries because that's. Uh, the topic of the month. So, uh, a grand juror is supposed to do certain things, and most grand jurors don't do them. They just go along for the ride, and they don't object when they're taken for a ride. Specifically, why they don't get involved in subpoenaing witnesses? They they don't even know who's been subpoenaed and don't care. Well, and never ask for anybody to be subpoenaed. They okay. just allow the, prosecute, the pr prosecutors to subpoena who they want and interview who they want and ask questions what they want. And a reporter just left here that get, said that uh, a good prosecutor get uh, a ham sandwich indicted, and it's kind of and that to me that's abdication. That's that is the American people abdicating their rights and their authority and, and their duties and obligations, and and they just. Uh, they just want to lay back and let everybody else do it. They don't want to get involved. Okay, let, let's let's start out with uh, how did you find out that you were on the grand jury? How did you find well, out? Well, you, you just get in the ma you just you just ask to report on a given day, just like any other jury situation. And when you get there, they just put all the names in a hat and draw them out. It's just a okay. So, lottery. All right. So then you you were selected by by random to be on this grand jury. Mm. Did you get a book telling you what you should or should not do? Yes, I did. What does the book and say? I read it, and it told me my rights, duties, responsibilities, and I acted accordingly. It, and, 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 and the only problem I had is that uh, the prosecutors hadn't read the book. Well, what, what specifically was your concern and your relationship with the prosecutors? Well, the first wreck was when I wanted to question witnesses direct myself. Does the book say you can do that? Yep. Okay. Yeah, all right, and then what happened? Well, they didn't like that idea. Well, why would a prosecutor not like you to uh, ask a question of a witness if the book says you can do it? Well, that's a good question. I, I think that's something we need to find out. I think that's something that probably, we're probably going to make some changes here in the grand jury system. And I bet in the future, grand juries uh, have, have the ability to exercise their rights better than they have in the past. Why would you feel that that would happen? Because of this situation, I mean, most grand jurors don't know they have the right to ask questions, and when they're told they don't, they just let it go. It's all right, you know. And I'm not saying they said we couldn't ask questions. We just had to launder our questions. We just had to give our questions to the prosecutor first, and then let him ask them. And uh, well, I don't understand. That's not my style. I mean, that's not what I wanted to do. I don't understand if the, if the book says that you, Hoppy Heidelberg, is a grand juror have the right to ask a direct question of a grand uh, of, of a witness and the prosecutor says don't read the book hey kid don't read the book do it my way kid what is that that's intimidation is it not? I, I don't know it made me mad I wasn't intimidated by it but I was angered by it now you were told by somebody that if you went public and started talking that you could be put in jail for six months yeah, and actually, uh, more than that, everybody says six months. That's six months per offense, according to the letter I got. They mentioned the word cumulatively. In other words, it's kind of like consecutively. Yeah, we'll put you in jail for six months, but don't count on it. It'd be six months per offense. So if we think you broke the rule six times, that's 36 months. So. Do you feel they'll put you in jail? No, I don't think so. That would be the dumbest thing they could ever do. Well, I don't see much smart being done. Uh, well, you're right about that. They shouldn't have fired me. That was dumb. The, the first stupid thing that happened was something called uh, Ruby Ridge and Randy Weaver. Mm -hmm. The second bunch of stupid things that happened was Waco. Mm -hmm. And now uh, a number of people have deep sub uh, suspicions uh, based upon uh, independent analysis that there's much more to the Oklahoma bombing than a couple of cuckoos driving up in a, in a truck with some uh, fuel oil bombs uh, made with fertilizer. Uh, can you make any comments uh, on the, the, the size of, of the plot or what, what your guesses might be based on your, your, your information? I just don't have enough information yet to, to make a comment on that. And I think that's unfortunate. I think I should have. As a grand juror, I ought to know a lot more than I know. 
The how, how long were you sitting on this grand jury? How, how many days were you in session? I can't, I can't tell you. I wouldn't if I could, and I can't tell you because I'd have to do a lot of research to figure that one out. Well, how many hours were you sitting there, would you say? Was, I, it, was it weeks, months, days? Well, it's not every day. For, it's months, but it's not every day for months. Okay. So it's a day here and a day there? I, something like that. I mean, I'm not going to be specific. All right, fine. Yeah. Uh, it's just as needed. You're just basically on standby, and they call you when they need you. Now, with, with all of the coverage of this, uh, did you ever get any information that helped you decide if it was just one bomb or, or many bombs? Was there any information given to you, or were you able to, to get any kind of an inkling? Well, they were very careful not to ever provide anything about the possibility of more than one bomb. I mean, uh, that's just what the seismologists and geophysicists think, that there were two bombs. I mean, the, 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 the prosecutors of the government is, uh, I mean, they're one bomb all the way. So but apparently they're, they're, they wasn't accurate. Yeah, there is evidence that there were two bombs. So the, the fact that you're convinced and everybody else that has apparently a lick of sense is convinced that there were two bombs, the government prosecutor said, no, don't look at that, just look at one bomb. In other words, are you telling me they narrowed the scope? I'm saying that, that I wasn't aware there was two bombs till after the indictments. I mean, that, 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 didn't even, that subject didn't come up, really, even in the media for a while. And I think it's been after the indictments uh, that, that this thing is heated up a little bit and, and it's been brought to the people's attention that there's a possibility that there's more than one bomb. Because uh, even though that some of the seismologists indicated that there were two, uh, that their instruments indicated two separate happenings, mm -hmm. uh, they said, well, one of them was uh, when the bomb went off and another's when the building fell down. Well, I'm not a seismologist. Well, they, they, apparently the seismologists say it was two bombs. We'll be right back. We've done a special three-hour broadcast with experts about the Oklahoma bombing. Munitions experts, FBI retired experts, you name it. I'm sorry, people, but the facts don't add up. We're not being told the truth. If you'd like a copy of the entire three-hour broadcast on audio... It's $14.95, $3 shipping and handling for three one-hour cassettes. If you'd like the video version, it comes on two videotapes, a total of three hours, six half-hour shows. Just $19.95 for the entire set. $6 shipping and handling. Call 1-800-888-9999, around the clock, 1-800-888-9999, or write to us at For the People, Bombing Tapes, 3 River Street, White Springs, Florida, 32096. We were planning to talk to Grand Juror Hoppy Heidelberg several days ago, but the big media got to him first, and he kept his promise and called us back the minute he could, and we thank him for it. Uh, following up this USA Today story, Hoppy Heidelberg, uh, you and I spoke on the break for a moment about Josh Nichols, a uh, 12-year-old boy. Your concern? 
Well, I'm concerned about the sanctity of the family issue. Uh, families are under attack, as we all know, in America today, and that's unfortunate, and that's the root cause of a lot of our, our issue, social problems we have today. And any time that immediate family members can be forced to testify against each other, um, well, that's not very cohesive. <laughs> that doesn't encourage cohesiveness of a family unit. And I just don't think that a child should be forced to testify against his parents. If he wishes to do so voluntarily, if, you, if we're talking about child abuse or something like that, that's completely different. But uh, you shouldn't be able to force a child against his will to testify against a parent. All right. Hoppy Heidelberg, thanks for taking time out of your day and coming on and talking to America on the People's Radio Network. I sure thank you. Thank you. You bet, my friend. Bye -bye. You take care. Well, folks, there it is, and you heard it here. Thanks. All the best. May God bless. Thank goodness for the alternative press, because here is the Packwood Report. It's the official indictment of Bob Packwood. Here's a man that's so crooked that we think when he dies, they may have to screw him in the ground. A man who loved corruption and who laughed about it, who wrote to his diary that he loved to sell out to the highest bidder. It is all here in the Packwood Report. I want you to get a copy of it. It's $10 and $3 shipping and handling. You can call right now and order it at 1-800-888-9999. That's 1-800-888-9999. How could he be so arrogant? Well, I'll tell you. He knew that he was on <laughs> he was going to retire and make 100 grand a year even after he was caught. Something's wrong in Washington, folks. Read the book. The For the People Telephone Ordering Center is online around the clock every day for your ordering convenience. Hi, my name's Patrick. It's my job to make sure that your order is shipped the very best way. And if you're not sure of the titles available, please ask. For the People stocks plenty of videos and books on all types of self-help, consumer, and public interest topics. Just have your Visa or MasterCard ready and call 1-800-888-9999.